Um, thank you all for coming today. So uh, today we have a very special presenter on Inside OPRF Museum. Um, Mary Ann Peruchnik is joining us and uh, many of you may know her from a lot of her different uh, facets of being a stalwart member of our community. Um, she is currently very active with the 19th Century Club and the League of Women Voters, as well as the Historical Society, uh, where she has been leading uh, group tours and uh, has been acting as a docent for OPRF Museum. And uh, that is where our story came from today, because um, I, I think maybe even in the span of one day, uh, Marianne, who was leading tours in the museum, noticed that a lot of visitors were asking about a specific set of chairs that we have on display in the museum. So that is the that is our story for today's program. So with that being said, I will welcome Marianne Peruchnik and turn this presentation over to her. Um. So I can't see if you can see me. So I'm hoping you can see me. Um, but I want to go on to the presentation and the chairs that um, Rachel was talking about. Um, they're a highlight of a visitor's stop at the museum. And people always stop and look at them and look at the sign. And they read the sign. and they say, an opera house? Oak Park had an opera house? And some of them say, when they read the sign and note that the opera house was located at 104 South Marion Street, wasn't that where Marlac House was? And isn't that where those condos, is that why those condos are called the opera house condos? Um, well, the answer to all of these questions is yes. So how did that one building site go from an opera house to a condominium? Let's find out. Uh, the story begins in 1902, which was the same year that Oak Park was incorporated as a village. At the time, it was a trend among small and mid-sized towns to have a building, a public building, called an opera house, even if there was very little opera ever performed in it. Um, they were more like theaters or auditoriums. The local Oak Park Argus newspaper was an advocate for such a building in our community. And when Dr. Charles Warrington Dunlop of New York who owned the land on the southeast corner of South Boulevard and, and what Wisconsin, or what is now Marion Street, uh, was persuaded to build a grand multi-use structure on the house. The Argus was ecstatic. At last, Oak Park is to have that much hoped for, long delayed necessity, a public hall. This ensures to Oak Park a thoroughly first class and up-to-date opera house a thing of beauty and, we hope, a joy forever. Dunlop hired E.E. E. Roberts uh, to design the building and local realtor Frank June to manage it. Okay. Uh, like many buildings of its time, the Warrington was a multi-use building. In addition to the opera house, the ground floor had space for nine stores. Each store had its own basement. The second floor held several offices and there were 10 apartments on the third floor. The local press closely followed the construction, reporting on the colors and designs of the trim and the steps taken to ensure the safety and comfort of audience members. Robert's design included stone and terracotta trimmings on a cream colored brick exterior and a wrought iron canopy over the sidewalk to protect theater goers as they alit from their carriages. You can see it in this drawing just under the flagpole. The vestibule was finished in marble 
with a retiring room for the ladies on one side and a gentleman's smoking room on the other. A grand staircase led to the balcony, which had seats for up to 500 people. Taking advantage of steel construction, the Warrington's main floor had no posts or pillars to obstruct the view of the stage. Marshall Field and Company was hired to do the decorating in colors of old ivory and red. The slant of the main floor was a matter of much concern during construction. It was originally planned to be flat with uh, removed freestanding chairs that could be moved around in case the hall was going to be used for dancing or other entertainments. But this would result in a viewing problem for patrons seated toward the middle or rear of the room and a safety hazard in, um, in the event of an emergency. Finally, it was decided to keep the main floor level and to install elegant opera chairs, such as the example at the museum, constructed in sections. Next time you visit the museum, be sure to check out the hat holder under the seat chairs. It was designed to hold the gentleman's hat during the performance and keep it safe and clean and off the floor. However, ladies' hats remained on their heads and occasionally obstructed the view of those seated behind them. The opening night was October 16th, 1902, and it was open to grand, grand fair fair, fanfare and high hopes. Um, although about 1,200 people comfortably filled the house, it was not a sold out performance. The choral group under the direction of Signor A. A. Giannata, whom some of you may remember from cemetery walks in Forest Home, included soloists from Chicago and Oak Park. According to the initial reviews of the event, quote, the auditorium presented a scene of great brilliance and beauty with its decorations in red and cream, with hundreds of electric lights and with a throng of handsomely dressed ladies and gentlemen. It was, the reporter gush, a blaze of glory that surpassed anything of the kind ever before attempted in Oak Park. Attracting an audience for a strictly musical venue, however, was difficult. People wanted more varied entertainment and the Warrington quickly became home to a series of stock companies. But it was also a community gathering place. In 1903, the high school glee club performed, noting that it was quote, a very comfortable theater and every seat a good one. High school graduation exercises were also held at Warrington. This image, which is part of the Barclay collection at the Oak Park Muse River Forest Museum, shows the grand entrance to the Warrington Hopra House and several of the stores in the building. Um, it's the grand entrance, and here's the storefronts. The large corner store, um, as you can see, was a pharmacy owned by Charles P. Miller. A dry goods store called the New Store pledged to save you the bother of going downtown. However, according to Barclay, the stores, about 12, filled up rapidly, but business was none too good as most of the villagers did their shopping in the loop. You can see the train tracks in the foreground, which villagers used to access the larger and more fashionable shops in downtown Chicago. Within months of its opening, the Warrington Opera House faced challenges. The Iroquois Theater fire in December 1903 forced the Opera House to close for several weeks while new fireproof curtains were installed and exits added and upgraded. Um, this interior shot highlighting the fireproof curtain is also from the Barclay Collection. On the recommendation of the village's public works department, a fire alarm box was added on the stage and connected to the village's fire alarm system. 
metal guards were added over and under the footlights and two additional exits were built and marked by exit signs. They're not shown on this um, picture. They were in the rear and on the balcony. Um, it was at this time that the seat section on display at the museum was removed to create another aisle. And the seats were stored in an attic not to be rediscovered for decades. Although the performers had hoped for a steady stream of musicals, competition from other venues forced them to reconsider. Audiences were treated to a variety of programs, such as travelogues, lectures, and melodramas. Belt Park River Forest Museum has a number of these programs from the early years, such as this one from 1906-07. An evening's entertainment with a 20 cent admission fee featured a seven act bill of assorted performers, ranging from jugglers and acrobats to magicians and ethnic comics. This photo, which is also by Philander Barkley, because you can see his bicycle on the sidewalk and now in the museum, was probably taken in the early teens. The marquee over the Warrington shows the play being performed, The Man of the Hour. Written by George Broadhurst, it focuses on a corrupt politician and depicts a fundamental conflict between upholding the public trust and scheming to serve oneself. Sounds fairly contemporary, I think. Although the, <laughs> although the uh, Warrington did continue to mount musical performances, it did Pinafore in 1904, it also had to contend with competition from nearby playhouses and theaters. Um, the Oak Park Theater, later called the Lamar, was built in 1913 to accommodate both movies and vaudeville performances and was practically right next door to Warrington. In 1910, the Grace Haywood Stock Company took up residence at the Warrington and became quite popular. Grace Hayward started her own theater company in 1901 with 15 players. They performed at the Warrington for five years, from 1909 to 1914, and they did nine performances and a new show almost every week. The only day there wasn't a performance was Sunday, when a local ordinance closed all theaters. Hayward was not only an actress, but a playwright as well. And she wrote several comedies for her troupe to perform. She was a very flamboyant figure and a suffragist whose benefits supported the like of Grace Hall Hemingway. She had several sexual liaisons and eventually married a man 15 years her junior. The company disbanded in 1920 and Hayward moved to Hollywood as a playwright and radio scriptwriter, This program was for the twins by Charles Dickens. Decades later, our own Doug Deutler turned Hayward's time into, in Oak Park into a musical, collaborating with composer John Steinhagen and the Village Players director, Michael Termine. The Wednesday Journal's reviewer called it enjoyable, delightful, energetic and full of talented men and women who look like they're having a lot of fun. While the rival Oak Leaves admitted it was a smart collaboration with some very good songs and strong lyrics. I don't have to remind you all that Doug was the theater critic for the Wednesday Journal. <laughs> this image from the stage of the Warrington, looking out at the audience is from a 1921 program for Fair and Warmer that is part of the museum's collection. I hope you can make out the small orchestra in the front row, which entertained during admission, and the hostess making her way down the aisle. According to one patron of the Warrington, Instead of having popcorn and candies available in the lobby, as is the custom today, 
Young men strode the aisles carrying trays laden with candy, popcorn, peanuts, and saltwater taffy, and young ladies dressed in black with white lace headbands and aprons carried trays filled with ice water between acts. Although the audience for this production filled the theater, nearby movie houses were drawing people away from the vaudeville performances at the Warrington. In 1929, the Earl Ross Players, a staff troupe that had been performing at the Warrington, opened a professional school of theater and allied arts. Among the offerings were a dancing program with classes in toe dancing, limbering, acrobatic work, buck and soft shoe routines, evening classes, children's classes, a vocal department providing coaching in opera, oratorio and concert singing and an acting school. They even guaranteed a screen test to those who took the course on talking picture stagecraft. A year later, however, the theater closed for remodeling. When it reopened, it had a very different look. This facsimile of an ad in the Oak Leaves, in the Oak Parker, proclaims that the Warrington has been transformed. The article accompanying it noted that this marks a new trend in entertainment for Oak Park, combining miniature golf, shuffleboard, and a modern sandwich shop and soda fountain. According to the article, the stage was camouflage and a sky complete with moons, suns, stars, and clouds was installed. The foyer was lined with trees and shrub, creating a veritable fairyland. There was even a running stream and a clubhouse in the balcony for those who preferred to watch rather than to play. Unfortunately, the golf club didn't last long. A year later, theater was back with a repertory company in residence and the Warrington had been rechristened as the Tudor Theater. By the time this photo was taken, the Warrington had been transformed again. Gone was the canopy, the roof decoration, and the golf course. Instead, the offices of the oak leaves occupied the premises. Publisher Telfer MacArthur boasted that, quote, we are morally certain that our paper is the one paper published in what was formerly A, a theater, and B, a golf course. A wall has replaced the curtain, and the stage is the publisher's office. The circulation department occupies the balcony, and the business manager the orchestra pit. We evacuated the fairways and hazards and the dust of long disuse and find it a fine airy, high ceilinged shop. Down the street from the Warrington, you can see the Lamar movie house. When it was built in 1913, it posed a competitive threat to the theater and vaudeville then featured at the Warrington. And when talkie, talkies became popular, the Lamar, then known as the Oak Park Theater, became much more competitive. These two photos show how the building was transformed over the years. As you can see, the roof line was flattened and the bay windows were removed and replaced by brick. Many of the first floor store spaces remained, but their ornamentation was lost. After the Warrington closed yet again in the 1950s, Peter Pasquini decided to remake the theater as a banquet hall, and a new generation of Oak Parkers came to know the building as the Lamar House, Marlack House. However, the week before Thanksgiving in 1961, a fire resulted in extensive damage, not only to the stores and hall on the main floor, but also to the 27 apartments on the second and third floors. Although no one died, six members of the fire department were hospitalized 
due to smoke inhalation. After this, the building got a new facade and interior. Although both the stage and the balcony were retained as features of the hall, the balcony was closed and only uh, and about 30% of the more than 70,000 square feet were went unused. As you can see in this photo, the outside facade was completely redone in cement. The canopy is back, although it's a far different design than the original wrought iron canopy. In 1969, Lou Fabri joined Pasquini as a partner in the Marlac House, becoming its sole owner in 1986. In a nod to the building's past, he named the main banquet hall the Warrington Room. It was Lou who found the chair section in the building's attic and donated it to the Historical Society in 1994. Marlac House closed in 2001 and most of the fixtures were auctioned off. The chandeliers, tables, and chairs ended up in a banquet hall in Dyer, Indiana. A contractor brought the Roman wall plates. Many of the statues are now in private homes and the stage pillars were installed in a bathroom in Elgin, Illinois. In 2004, the building was demolished and was replaced by a condominium and retail complex. But the memory of the Warrington lives on, not only in the name of the complex, but also in the photos that decorate its lobby, reproductions of some of those in the Historical Society's collection. I hope you've enjoyed um, this ramble through history on the corner of South Boulevard and Marion. Um, and I encourage you to visit the museum uh, to see additional artifacts from the period when the Warrington Opera House was the Marlac House. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. Um, this was an extra special look at some of the really rich history of like theater and um, sort of the arts in the early Oak Park days. So I really appreciated learning about that. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you on the call will remember uh, going to the Marlac House and maybe um, some of this you already knew, but maybe some of the features inside. Now that I hear that they kept some of the features from the Opera House, that seems like it would have been strange to see. But now we know. So um, if any of you have questions about today's program, um, feel free to put them in the chat box here. We've got a few minutes and we can answer some of those potentially. And as you're doing that, um, I will take a minute to plug a couple of things that we have coming up at the museum. Um, this weekend, we have two walking tours, um, both on Saturday. One of them is in the morning, uh, looking at Evans Field uh, Forest Preserve and the history tied to that area. And then in the afternoon, we have our Ridgeland Ramble walking tour, which is uh, in the neighborhood around the museum. So if you are interested and you don't have your tickets yet for either of those, please go to our website, which you can see on the screen. Um, we also have a walking tour of the Forest Home Cemetery, the area west of the Des Plaines River, which we normally don't go on in our annual cemetery walks. And I believe the next one will be led by Marianne, which is on August 29th. So if that is of interest to you as well, please again, check out our website for tickets. So I think we have a couple of questions. You certainly have some comments. <laughs> the first one, I wanna throw this out there because I don't know if you know, uh, we can certainly check if this is the case, but uh, our question is, was Dr. Dunlop related to the local Dunlop bankers? And uh, the Dunlop 
Bank building is the one that uh, most recently was formerly Prairie Bread's Kitchen, um, and that's sort of Kitty Corner um, on on um, North Boulevard and right. Marion. So it would have been across the tracks, right? And uh, off the top of my head, I don't know if it's the same Dunlops, but I can imagine that would be the case. I, I would guess there might be some relation, um, but it's not something I didn't know about the, the Dunlops um, owning the other side of the property, but um, it certainly makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read this one? Um, so we have a comment from uh, one of our um, other volunteers here at the Historical Society and a, a past board member. Um, Gary Schwab says that in the 1990s, he wrote a proposal to turn the Marlac into an arts center by providing development incentives for the rest of the site. It didn't go far, but we did get the builder of the Metropolitan Metropolis Arts Center in Arlington Heights to visit. Um, the village told him to go away. Uh, that's really too bad because I think that that having it an, another arts venue uh, would be fun in, here in North Park. Um, so um, we also have a comment that uh, one of our viewers uh, knows someone who lives in the condo building. Which uh, just to say that the use of that area um this is this corner seems to me like a, a really good example of oak parks transitioning over time of the community um, starting out as a very sort of formal arts um center and then moving on to an event space that um is known around you know, surrounding neighborhoods, surrounding suburbs, people came from all over the place to go to this event center. And now being a condo building, um, say what you will, but it sort of fits with how Oak Park has, has developed over time. Um, so I think that might be it for today. Unless okay. Um, so I want to thank you, Marianne, very much for your work in, in putting together this program. And I want to thank you all on the call for coming. Uh, again, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me after today. Um, and if you have some other um, ideas for programs that you'd like to see in the future, please let me know. And I hope to see you again next time.